I'm glad to be following Dr. Bosch. I think it's um, it's worthwhile keeping in mind the fact that when we're dealing with glioma and particularly glioblastoma, we're dealing with a whole brain disease. This is not a focal disease, and uh, it it raises fundamental questions about then what role we have as surgeons. And surprisingly to me, over and over again, the data show that we have a remarkable role. And um, I'm going to speak a little bit to that today. Zach asked me to cover the role of imaging in glioma surgery, and um, I will show you kind of what I what I think uh, we have currently available to us, and what um, intimate a little bit towards what hopefully we will have coming to us in the near future. So my objectives today are to talk with you about what the effect of surgery on outcomes is in patients with glioma, uh, to discuss the role of advanced imaging and preoperative planning for glioma surgery, and then talk about intraoperative imaging in glioma surgery. So this is a slide from uh, nearly two, uh, more than two decades ago now, 25 years ago. Um, this is from uh, data from uh, Pat Kelly's group when he was at NYU. And he had done a study where he, after resecting tumor, did biopsy at different intervals from the tumor mass. And what this single figure is showing here is that even as you go up to two centimeters away from the tumor mass, they were still finding tumor cells. In other words, this is not a focal cancer. Glioblastoma meets uh, the NCI definition of an infiltrating disease. And he concluded a paper uh, many about a decade after that initial one by saying that as a prognostic factor in malignant glioma, the extent of resection falls far behind factors over which we have no control, tumor grade, patient age, and Konoski performance scale score. And in this paper, he concluded that surgery is an effective means to reduce mass effect and temporarily achieve local control. But he was very skeptical that surgery had any effect on the biology of the disease. And um, I will echo Dr. Bosch's comment from his talk that we're now at a point of understanding the biology of this disease to maybe understand that's not the case. But why would tumor surgery have an effect on tumor biology or survival, and particularly in an infiltrative disease like this? We all know that surgery uh, immediately causes a reduction in mass effect, and oftentimes our patients get better from surgery simply because we're leaving that mass effect. It also plays a role in preservation of neurologic function. Uh, as much as we put our patients sometimes at risk with surgery, uh, controlling tumor in this disease is probably the best way we have for preserving patients from seeing neurologic decline. There are also opportunities to decrease tumor growth uh, through reseeding, uh, to decrease tumor spread uh, by cytoreduction, uh, by uh, effectively reducing the bulk of the biologically active compartment of tumor. And there are good data to suggest that our work causes an inflammatory response, which could be important for uh, the efficacy of therapies after surgery. So if you look at the current standards for treatment for glioblastoma, and, and this is a moving target, obviously, um, our, our standards are still driven by this study by Roger Stoop from, again, more than a decade ago. And if you look at his study, the interesting thing is that they make the point that 84% of patients underwent debulking surgery. But if you parse through this data, there's no way to really understand what that means and, and whether extent of resection uh, had any effect on outcome in, in this patient cohort. The Cochrane reviews, um, based on uh, the data that were available, and this is, again, quite dated now, uh, conclude that there are no quality evidence uh, to suggest that surgery has any uh, role in improving survival in patients with high-grade glioma. There are data, though, to suggest that we do play a significant role. This is a very good uh, meta-analysis that was done by the MD Anderson group a, a few years ago. And they looked at a number of uh, studies that looked at extent of resection and its effect of survival. And what they conclude is that the meta-analysis of 37 studies supports the use of gross total resection for glioblastoma for reducing one and two-year mortality. 
just to highlight a few of, I think, the, the, the most qualified studies to try to answer this question. This is a study from the University of Washington from Burgers Group in 1999, before his return to UCSF. And they found that the percent of resection and volume of residual disease, but not preoperative tumor value, uh, correlated with time to progression and survival. And, and they found that this was a quantitative um, effect. In other words, the more we resected, the better patients did. Uh, Nader, I know I'm speaking a little bit while, uh, later, but uh, his, uh, his uh, review of the experience from UCSF uh, also supported this finding. They found that extent of resection had a significant uh, effect on survival. And again, this was an iterative finding. In other words, the more we resect, uh, the better patients do. What do we know about low-grade glioma in surgery? And uh, this is uh, a, a study that I think is worth bringing up to contextualize this question. Uh, this was from uh, a Scandinavian group that uh, was able to do a study that most of us would not be able to. They have a, a socialized system there uh, where patients are actually segregated based on their home address. And they were able to look at patients that were sent to hospitals where the primary uh, surgeon uh, taking care of patients with low-grade glioma had two very different approaches to management of these patients. So this is a very uh, homogeneous society uh, and um, patients who are segregated purely based on their uh, geography of living. They designated one hospital where patients were uh, treated uh, aggressively um, and uh, where the goal of surgery was uh, maximal safe resection and another group where the approach was uh, biopsy followed by watchful waiting. And looking at this cohort study and following these two along, what they found was that there was a discrimination in survival between patients who were triaged to hospital B where resection was preferred compared to those sent to hospital A where biopsy was preferred. And, and this, these two curves uh, began to segregate even further as uh, time went on. So from this, they concluded that for patients in Norway with lower grade glioma, treatment at a center that favored early resection was associated with better overall survival than treatment at a center that favored biopsy. This doesn't get to the question of extent of resection, but it does suggest to us that we should be considering surgery in these patients. In terms of extent of resection, this is a data again from the UCSF group. Uh, Justin Smith looked at 216 patients who had undergone surgery for hemispheric low-grade glioma at UCSF. And now this is, this is difficult because we're not looking at patients who uh, were followed and did not have surgery, but in the patients who, undergone, who undertook surgery, uh, Justin found that patients who had gross total resection or patients who had less than 25 centimeters of residual tumor after surgery had longer survival. Um, and interestingly, I, I think importantly what they found was that they were able to achieve these outcomes with really a limited amount of uh, uh, morbidity to their patient population. And this is critical because if you look um, at what happens to our patients when we give them a deficit, uh, this is uh, data from Alfredo's group uh, and from uh, Miriam Raman, who's at University of Florida. Uh, what, what they showed is that when we hurt our patients, unintentionally, of course, but when we hurt our patients in surgery, we essentially obviate any benefit that they gain from aggressive resection. So in other words, what the data teach us is that we should try to do as much as we can aggressively for our patients, but we've got to do this without hurting them. And if we leave them with a deficit, we take away the benefit that we may have gained them with surgery. So where does, where does imaging and uh, preoperative planning fall into this? So, you know, when I, I, I've, I've spoken with my colleagues um, in radiology about designing programs that are specific to taking care of our neuro-oncology patients and, and trying to communicate with them uh, 
this is kind of the set of questions that that I've over and again asked uh, in terms of trying to come to come together with them to design uh, imaging platforms that we should use routinely for our patient population. So, what's critical for us to know? We we need for them to be able to tell us what are is it that we're looking at. We need to understand where what we're looking at is, whether it's in eloquent tissues or non-eloquent tissues, what the relationship of the anatomy of the lesion is to the critical white matter tracts in that area. We need to, from this, determine for ourselves what are our goals. And in articulating that, we have to understand what is at risk. And these are kind of the tools that we have available to us to try and answer all those questions. We've got structural imaging, uh, that includes both just structural MRI and tractography, what I would call biological imaging, uh, and by this I mean spectroscopy and perfusion and radio diagnostics, and then finally functional imaging. And uh, specifically, I'll talk about task-based functional MRI, uh, but we started using resting state fMRI at our center as well. So to go over all these, I'm going to use a case of, of my own. This is a young woman, uh, no significant past medical history, uh, she's actually a, 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 a CEO of uh, a company um, uh, here in Toronto. Um, she had this lesion discovered on presentation with a partial seizure. And um, she initially saw a senior colleague of mine who told her this is an unresectable lesion. And um, she was simply watched. And over time... Um, and, and I'm, by over time, I mean over the course of about 12 months, uh, serial MRI showed slow growth of the lesion uh, with question of new foci of internal enhancement. And so lending these, quest these, these questions to this case, what's the lesion, where's the lesion, what's at risk, and what are my goals? Um, you know, what we were seeing here, I think, with the evolving imaging was a low-grade glioma with possible... Uh, areas of malignant uh, degeneration. Uh, it looks intimate to the motor and sensory cortices, uh, which is probably why my partner had initially said this is a non-resectable lesion. Uh, resecting a lesion of this sort would obviously put those functions at risk. Uh, and uh, I didn't feel yet that we had enough information to think about what the goals of surgery could be. So in terms of structural imaging, we first put her through tractography, and and um, we were using a particular platform that allows whole brain tractography here. But uh, many of us do uh, uh, non-automated uh, uh, tract development as well, using uh, regions of significance. But here we could see that the cortical spinal tract seemed to be pushed forward by the tumor and to be hugging kind of the underside of the tumor. And so it told me, in other words, that I had a cortical approach that wouldn't be uh, putting any subcortical uh, tracks at risk. When we do uh, subcortical white matter tracking in our uh, institution, this is kind of the, the cluster of white matter tracks that we uh, typically uh, look to reconstruct. Um, and obviously, not every case requires uh, you to define these. Uh, but um, uh, if, if we think about kind of what we should be asking our radiologists for, this is, this is a pretty formative list. I then sent this young woman for biological imaging, and, and we did spectroscopy. And it looked like a, particularly a, a, a pretty cold lesion with some small areas of uh, higher metabolic rate. And that gave us some comfort that, uh, we were dealing still with something that wasn't yet transformed into a higher grade lesion. Uh, uh, but it did suggest that there were some areas uh, that if we took this on surgically, where we would want to use those areas specifically as sites for uh, histologic analysis to make sure that we didn't undergrade what this young woman was dealing with. And you can see here, there were some areas, uh, particularly in this cortical uh, nodular area, where we saw uh, higher degrees of perfusion. We then moved on to functional imaging for her, and for her specifically task-based functional MRI. And 
this was uh, a great finding for us. So this is uh, a hand motor task. And you can see the area that's lighting up for hand function, what you'd expect to correlate here on the other side with the hand knob. And to our surprise, it showed that the, ant the motor cortex was actually anterior to the lesion. And so this really defined for me what we were dealing with here. We were dealing with a lesion where the anterior border of the lesion was somatosensory cortex and where the remainder was the, in the inferior parietal lobule. And this is actually tractography after surgery. You can see the cortical spinal tracts, and you can see uh, that basically what I ended up resecting preserved the somatosensory cortex, which was involved with tumor, and the motor cortex you can see here being seated uh, to develop the cortical spinal tract. But this picture is what really gave me an idea of what my goal was. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear from the other uh, speakers what their experience has been uh, with patients with tumor that extends into the somatosensory cortex. That, In my experience, when I've lingered into uh, areas that, uh, stimulation results in, some, in sensory in sensory phenomena. Uh, when I've resected tumor in those areas, it's left patients with uh, non-negligible deficits and and um, left them with uh, sensory issues that um, uh, have functional outcomes for them. And so, with this young woman, uh, when I thought about my goal for surgery, it really was uh, to resect the bulk of the tumor while leaving this area here that I suspected to be somatosensory cortex. And I went in with a plan that um, uh, we would stimulate and find the somatosensory cortex, and that would be the anterior border of my reception. So those are some tools that we can use to, to again, um, give us an idea of what it is that we could achieve in surgery and what our goals could be. Uh, and. Uh, this young woman I took to surgery uh, awake, and uh, she went uh, into surgery and uh, through surgery with awake mapping. Um, I know that uh, the other speakers have touched on that already. Uh, and then we think about, is there some way that we can figure out how much and what we've done uh, before uh, we send the patient off for post-operative imaging? And we have now, I think, uh, as a field, a number of a number of um, adjuncts that we can use for real-time imaging, and that involves intraoperative MRI, intraoperative ultrasound, and Raman spectroscopy and OCT. I know Dan is speaking later, and I won't touch to this, but I'll speak to these two. Um, as uh, as uh, Zap was saying earlier. Uh, I am stuck in Toronto. I practice medicine in Toronto, and uh, there are some wonderful elements to practicing in the Canadian healthcare system. Um, I don't have an intraoperative MRI, and and uh, there are fiscal reasons for that. And I suspect that's the case for for many of you. We don't all have access to this, and and for many of us, it is a financial issue for our hospitals. We do have data to suggest that intraoperative MRI is valuable. Uh, and this is, again, I'll, I'll point you to this systematic review uh, by uh, Von Steinpick. Uh, and they looked at uh, 12 studies uh, that uh, reported data on use of intraoperative MRI uh, in patients with uh, high-grade glioma. And from this analysis, they concluded that based on the available literature, we have level two evidence that uh, intraoperative MRI guided surgeries is more effective than conventional neuronavigation guided surgery in increasing extent of resection, in enhancing quality of life, and uh, in prolonging survival after resection. And again, I think all of these measures uh, really uh, come back to uh, simply the improvement in achieving gross total resection that IMRI can offer. What we do have at our center and what we use quite extensively is uh, ultrasound. And um, uh, we use a technology that I think has been most um, uh, greatly kind of pushed forward by uh, my friend Frank Demeco in Milan uh, using 
uh, uh, ultrasound uh, hyperechoic bubbles uh, essentially contrast enhance ultrasound during glioblastoma resection. And uh, this really allows for a nice real-time intraoperative assessment of uh, extent of resection. Uh, I will say that even without uh, using the contrast uh, enhanced element of this, uh, ultrasound's a fantastic tool. And I would, uh, if it's not something that you've integrated into your practice, um, I, I would suggest you toward it. It's uh, uh, a remarkable real-time tool. Um, and in some ways, I think, uh, you know, for me, practically uh, by necessity, but uh, in some ways can obviate the need for um, uh, uh, intraoperative MRI. There are values in having ultrasound even beyond some of the other adjuncts that we have, like fluorescein or 5-ALA. With, with both of those agents, uh, we're only able to see fluorescence if we have exposed tumor. And there's always the risk of missing tumor uh, because it's not within our uh, direct view. And, and uh, again, the, one of the benefits of ultrasound is that this uh, risk is obviated. Uh, it allows us to see deep into the tissue. So to conclude, uh, aggressive surgical resection prolongs survival in patients both with low and high-grade glioma. This benefit is negated uh, by neurologic deficit, and so our approach needs to be to somehow uh, balance the desire for aggressive resection uh, with the need to protect our patients from neurologic injury. Preoperative imaging can be a valuable adjunct for surgical planning and critical to understand what the goals of surgery are and what the risks of surgery are. And intraoperative imaging can offer real-time assessments of extent of resection. So, Zach, I, I have some slides as well on resting state functional uh, uh, imaging if, if it's something that would interest the group and if we've got time. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, Sunit, I think we have about another five or ten minutes, so I think that would be an interesting topic to discuss and wrap it up, and then uh, we can have some time for comments and questions. Great. So this is, um, we've used uh, task-based functional MRI extensively at our institution, and I suspect it's something that most of you have access to and uh, that's become pretty routine in the field. Um, uh, we have, over the last two years, uh, started using resting state uh, fMRI more extensively. And um, a lot of our work has been driven uh, by a collaboration with Eric Luthard and uh, the imaging group at Wash U. Uh, and uh, Eric has published extensively on resting state fMRI. Um, and I'll direct you to his work for further information. But I wanted to give you just a sense of this. This is something that um, I think is, is uh, going to become incorporated into uh, our clinical lives, and that could have a real benefit to our patients. So task-related uh, activation uh, basically involves tracking of changes in bold signal uh, that are attributed to an experimental paradigm. In other words, we put patients through a task, we look for changes in bold signal that accompany that task. And that allows us to, to map brain function onto brain regions. Now, in normal task-related activation, uh, uh, fMRI, the noise uh, that accompanies the signal, uh, which is abundant, is factored out. And the idea of resting state fMRI really developed from an idea that uh, that noise might actually be telling us something. And um, in fact, if you look at the brain uh, just during rest, when uh, here, this is a macaque, but opening eyes, closing eyes, opening eyes. You can see changes in bold function in the occipital lobe that uh, accompany that uh, pattern of opening and closing one's eyes. So this is, again, this is just um, at rest. So the idea between uh, the idea of resting state fMRI is that the brain's always active, even in the absence of explicit input or output. And in fact, that task-related changes uh, only account for about five percent of the brain's total energy consumption. And so that leads to the question, this noise that we're seeing in standard activation studies, uh, 
you can consider this noise, or you could say that this is physiologic fluctuations of neuronal activity. And uh, I'm not going to get into the mathematics of this, but basically what looking at this noise allows is, is actually an identification of patterns in particular areas that are very redundant for uh, identifying the geography of that area. In other words, there's a particular output that is redundant to the motor cortex. There's a particular output that's redundant to the occipital cortex and visual cortex. Uh, there's a particular uh, area that's redundant to the somatosensory cortex. And uh, you can we actually now have paradigms that allow us to identify these areas where that activity is present just at rest, and we can map that on uh, to a structural map and from that predict where the motor and sensory cortices are. And it's it's quite good. Um, and And we've gotten to be quite good at identifying primary motor, primary visual, and sensory. Uh, it has not yet... Uh, gotten to the point where we're able to find um, speech cortices well. And uh, the WATCHU group has been working on this. Uh, there's an excellent group at the University of Washington that's working on this, an excellent group at UCSF that's been working on this. Uh, we haven't succeeded yet, but um, I think there's a, there's a chance that as this technology uh, 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 improves and as our science improves, uh, that, th that this could become a very valuable clinical tool for us. And if you think about kind of the, the demands on the patient of doing uh, task-based fMRI, and maybe even more critically, the demands on the system to do functional uh, uh, task-based fMRI, um, you know, we require special magnet time. We require uh, a physiologist who's in the magnet. We need to have... Um, uh, a technician or a radiologist who's capable of uh, interpreting the data and creating the maps. Uh, there's a there's a possibility that that resting state fMRI may be able to replace that with something that's much more mechanized. So one last thing that I'll finish off on is radio diagnostics, and this is a a group from uh, Elizabeth Maher's uh, a paper from Elizabeth Maher's group at uh, UT Southwestern. Um, uh, I know there's a uh, group at UCSF that has released a similar paper. Um, this is using uh, signatures on mass spec uh, to identify um, uh, 2-HG, which 2-hydroxyglutarate, as you know, is an uh, uh, oncometabolite uh, that uh, accumulates in uh, tumors that harbor an IDH mutation. And uh, they have shown that you can actually, they're capable of using mass spec uh, to identify that uh, through um, uh, uh, MR spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, there's a chance that um, more and more our, our radiology will actually be able to give us uh, a idea of what the histology we may expect uh, before we, we go in and have to have something for the pathologist to look at. So, Zach, thanks very much. Again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry not to have been able to be with you myself. Um, uh, I have to thank uh, Monica and her team for the Herculean effort that they made to try to get me there last night. And I'm, I'm sorry Toronto didn't, uh, uh, wasn't really willing to participate. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Dr. Das? You know, I, I think the some of the things you touched on we're going to come back to later this afternoon. Um, Dr. Henson earlier this morning had talked a little bit about the 2-hydroxyglutarate uh, fingerprint, which you touched on, and uh, we're going to have Dr. Oranger speaking soon about Raman SPECT uh, for reconstruction. And I think what we're seeing is this convergence of all these different specialties to make the overall care more effective, whether it's surgical or medical or some combination thereof. Um, so any, any other questions before we let Dr. Doss uh, go back to whatever he's doing? And I'm not sure he even has pants on. He probably just has, <laughs> probably just has a jacket. It's all good from here on, man. It's all good from here. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Sunid, thanks for dialing in. All right. Thanks, Ed.